Amen. If you can get your Bibles out, let's raise the Word of God high together and say this with me. This is my Bible, God's holy Word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path and hide its words in my heart that I may not sin against God. Amen. So continuing in the presence of God, and I want you to know um, if everything could fit together perfectly without the intention of man, today it did. From the song that the kids sang to uh, the song that we opened up with, Sing to the King, today we're going to talk about serving the King. But before we do that, I want us to come before his presence knowing that we've come in worship, that our, that our, our goal here today is to do nothing but to exalt Christ and to lift him up to remove all of our peripheral issues, to remove all of our likes and dislikes, and to say, God, we have come here to worship you alone. We've come in here also into his holiness, and that God has called you to be holy as he is holy. And if we're going to experience the presence of God, we have to dwell in his holiness. We've also come in here in fellowship. If you've come in here today to worship our God, you're declaring that you love God and that you love your fellow man around you. That each of us, if we want to be in the presence of God, nothing can take the precedence of loving God and loving each other. And the last thing I want you to know, if you're in here today and we're in the presence of God, we have come into the presence of God to be his witness. Just like Martin Luther did over 500 years ago, it is our job today to be God's witness to a world that needs Jesus. And with that, I want us to open this service today, how they would open the courts and how they would declare war, and how they would declare prayer in the day. And I want you to know, as I, as I do about what I'm about to do, that we are calling the court, we are coming into the courts of God right now. We are his subjects, and we are in his courts. I don't have to blow a ram's horn, but every day you walk through these doors, you have come into his courts. Every time you bow a knee in prayer, you've come into his courts. Every time you call upon his name, driving down the car in your car, going to class, kids, going to work, adults, if you take God with you, you are in his courts. And you are his servant. So today I want to talk about this king and servant relationship. We don't like to talk about this, but the Bible tells us that we are either a slave to sin or we are a slave to God. You need to make a choice. Which one's it going to be? I choose to be a slave to God. Now there are times where I make Jesus less of a king, and I try to say I don't like this or like that, and you do the same thing, and don't tell me you don't. And it's in moments like that that we start to move back towards the slavery of sin. But we should be constantly wanting and desiring to be a slave to Christ. The king is present, and we are called his subjects in the scripture. We are called his slaves. Uh, so I don't want you to confuse this sermon with modern day slavery movement. It has nothing to do with that. Being a slave to Christ is freedom. Because the Bible tells us that God is a liberator and that where Jesus is, there is liberty. So the freedom you can have, the greatest freedom you can ever have is to have your soul set free by what Jesus did for you and me. That should have been an amen. <laughs> Psalm 47, 7 and 8. I've got a bunch of scriptures. They will be on the screen. They're also in your bulletin. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with a song. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. Right now, have you declared God, not just God is already ruler of the earth, did you see that? And ruler of the nations. Now it doesn't always seem that way, does it? But I want you to tell you that the greatest place God should be right now is he should be enthroned on your heart. The way God rules the earth and the way God rules the nations is that he rules individuals, he rules churches, he rules people, he rules nations, he rules the earth. It must start with you 
bowing your knee to him and declaring him what the scripture already says. Lord, you're the ruler of the earth. God, you are the king of nations. Doesn't ma- Listen, doesn't matter who sits in the White House or rules any nation upon this earth. Jesus is the ruler of nations. I want you to get that straight. Whether you like or you don't like, God didn't ask you that. He is king of the nations. Psalm 24, 7. Lift up your heads, O gates. Be lifted up, O ancient doors. The king of glory may come in. Have you allowed today for the gates of your heart and the doors to be open so that the king of glory may be here today? If not, do it right now. May the king of glory be here. May we lift up our gates. May we open our doors so that he is always welcome in this place where we assemble to worship. So that he always is with us and always present. By the way, he's those things anyway, but if you don't open the gates of your heart or open the doors of your heart, if you don't let Christ in, how can you expect him to be king when you're not letting him in to rule your life? Amen, you follow me? He's there. We have to intentionally do these things and say, God, you are my king. We cannot make Christ the king on our own terms. How many of us have done that? You know, God, I, I, I don't want to give that up. If I follow your ways, I have to do this? Really? I can remember when I was the football uh, chaplain for Kent State University, I would, I would have people and they would, they would be really close. These ball players were really ploy, uh, close to receiving Christ. And then he would say, uh, they called me PC. W- what do we have to give up? And I said, everything. And they would look at me, you mean girls? Yes. You mean beer? Yes. Some of them walked away sad, but some of them got it. The same is true for you. Every day when I preach or every week when I preach in here, I see faces of some people that just refuse to give up everything to serve the king. I see some of us that try to make Jesus the king of our own liking. We pick and choose what we want to do for him, but we don't fully serve him. We don't fully give us our, his, him our heart. I want you to think about this for a minute. If you were in here today and you are really the slave of a king. And you just have a bad day. Do you have a choice if he calls you into his courts? Oh, I don't want to make breakfast for you today, your highness. I'm sorry. You can make it yourself. Fastest way to a guillotine, right? Imprisonment. No. We don't have a choice We cannot make Jesus this king of our own liking, of our own making. When we come into his courts, when we come into his presence, we have come into the presence of a king. And by the way, he's the king of kings. So we cannot make him Jesus king of our own making. So I want you to imagine, if Jesus literally, when I blew that horn, when I blew the ram's horn, he's here. Imagine if he literally walked through these doors, just like Martin Luther did tonight. Imagine if he was really right up here. How would you respond differently? I want everybody to think of that in their heart. How would you have approached church today differently if you knew Jesus would literally be here? Here's some language I think we would use. I hope. Your majesty. Here I am. Use me. Your majesty, I am so sorry that I came in here with an attitude today. Will you forgive me? I'm here to serve you. Your majesty, I'm sorry I didn't sing with all of my heart, but I rejoice in you. Your majesty, let your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. Your majesty, I am your loyal and faithful servant. I serve you out of unworthiness, but I beg that someday you will say, my good and faithful servant. Would it change how we approach church? Would it change how we approach life? I hope it would. So I want to do this. Even though Jesus may not have literally in the flesh walked into into this body of Christ, it says he is the ruler of this body of Christ. It says he is the head of this church. 
which means he is present in a business meeting. He is present in a worship service. He is present in the nursery. He is present in children's church. He is present with everything that we do in our life that's set to glorify his name. Because it says, open your gates so that the glory of God may come in. So the more that we do that, the more he is glorified, the more we realize he's king. Just in case you didn't know that Jesus was declared king, I want to give you a little historic lesson. Let's look at a couple of scriptures here with the scriptures declaring Christ is king. Matthew 2.2. 2. I love Christmas, by the way. Did you know we're about 60 days from Christmas? Praise Jesus. Matthew 2.2. 2. This is your early Christmas. Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. These wise men. These magi that have looked to the stars and had waited, they knew of the ancient writings that declared that this star would come and that this great king would be born, a king of the Jews. And they had come not just to honor any king, but to worship the king. They may not have even fully known what they were doing, but imagine what they did. They gave up everything. They traveled from afar. They brought the greatest wealth that they possibly could assemble on that day and time, and they came far and came to this baby to worship this king who was born. Even upon his death, even though they meant to mock him, listen to what they did in Matthew 27, 37. And over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Now imagine this, Pilate being used by God and not even realizing it. Pilate being a governor of his day, a leader of his day, would not allow the Jews to have their way. So he said, no, I'm going to declare who Jesus really is, King of the Jews. Not even realizing the prophecy that would be fulfilled, and that even at the cross, the place where we worship Christ the most, he was declared king. Where one person may have meant it to be mockery, we consider it the greatest, most sacred place that we could ever assemble at the foot of the cross. Here is your king, King Jesus. Revelation 19, 16. God pulls it all together. Listen to this. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name that is written. King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen? Amen. It will always remind us when we see Jesus in his robe, King of kings and Lord of lords. When we see Jesus' thigh, the only tattoo that I see that Jesus ever had other than the scars on his hands and feet, King of kings and Lord of lords. Wow. We will forever see that. Never to be taken out of our mind for all of eternity that he is king, that he is Lord. Why not begin it now? Because he is king and he is Lord, whether you like it or not. Whether a ruler of a nation likes it or not, whether you like it or not. Whether you're stubborn or stiff-necked and you say, I refuse to be baptized. I refuse to come join the church. I refuse to give up this part of my life. I refuse this or that, whatever it may be. I'm holding on to something I just can't let go of. Maybe it's anger, maybe it's bitterness, maybe it's jealousy. You want me to keep going? There's something maybe that's holding you back from really letting Christ be king and Lord of you. The sooner you identify that, the faster you can serve him. Because the Bible tells us this in Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow on heaven and earth, on heaven and earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Have you bowed your knee to Jesus? Have you declared him as what he already is, Lord of lords and King of kings? Have you given him the fullness of who you are, your heart, your soul, your entire being, as the scripture says, your mind, body, soul, and strength? These are questions, all of us, that must penetrate who we are. And we must ask, am I doing that every day? Is my life symbolically bowed to Christ as Lord? 
Have I professed just like heaven professes every day where it never ceases to praise God in his throne room, where there's constant incense of prayers that meets Jesus, God's nose, God the Father's nose, and it says it's a pleasing aroma to him. Do we, in essence, do the same thing every day with our life, declaring him as Lord and King? We should, amen? Is it hard? Yes. That's why when you begin to fail, the fastest place you need to run back to is on your knees. Say, Jesus, you're a Lord. I messed up. Jesus, you're a king. Here I am to serve. That's why we learn in Isaiah 6, here I am, send me. These concepts over and over again where we become a servant of the king. Everybody open your Bibles to Luke chapter 17. To be a slave in the first century was not necessarily a pleasant thing, but they were, some slaves were taken care of better than the others. They were more like employees, but they worked 24-7. Some of you do that already, right? Amen? All right? So, this slave that I'm going to read about in this text has got a tough, tough job because he not only has to work the fields, he then has to come in and cook the meals. So this man that Jesus is referring to here must not have been a wealthy slave owner, but would have been uh, a typical of this day where he may have had one servant that had to do everything. So I want you to, to read what Jesus is doing here. Will any one of you, in verse 7, will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at my table? Let's stop. What slave owner would do that? Hey, well, Jesus, but we're not there yet, okay? So here we are, and you've worked, you're the slave. You've worked so hard out in the field. You've taken care of the sheep, and you're, you're tired, man. You come home, man, you want to put your feet up. You want to turn the TV on. You just want to chill. You want your master to come bring you food because he's already got it ready for you. It's not how it works, is it? No master would do that. Will he not rather say to him this? Prepare supper for me, dress properly, and serve me while I eat and drink. And after that, you will eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because he did what he was already commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, are to say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. Every single one of us in here. And this gets so confusing, but I want you to hear this. We are unworthy servants of Christ. And what we want to do is stand before him someday and simply thank him for letting us do our duty. And our duty is to serve him. Our duty is not to come home from work and say, I'm too tired to go to church tonight because it's Wednesday night. Our job is not to come in here and say, I'm too tired to sign up for the fall fest, or I'm too busy to do this, or I don't like that, so I'm not going to join that. Or I just want to come sit in the pew. I just want to come and be ministered to, and that's good. But at some point, we have to remember, who do we serve? The Lord. The Lord of lords and the King of kings. The one that has the tattoo to prove it on his leg and will be always enshrined upon his robe that we will see every day of eternity to remind us he is Lord. We are unworthy servants called to simply do our duty and as we do that, we hope to hear our Lord someday say, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's what we live to serve God to hear. That's what I live to hear God say about me. And I hope that he will say it because he means it, because he won't lie to me. Amen? Chris, well done, my good and faithful servant. And I want to do so well that he just doesn't give me a little bit to do, but he gives me a lot to do. I want to be the type of servant that God looks down upon me and say, Chris, you've done a lot with the little I've given you. I'm going to give you more now. That's how we should all serve, not for our own pride, but for the glory of God. Because we live to serve what? Him. And all of us need to come with this attitude. Listen, I approach this pulpit every week and say, God, I'm unworthy to preach. But because of you, you've made me worthy. Because you've made this my duty. Every week, I'm passionate about the things I do. Why? Not just because I work for the church, but because God's called me to that duty. 
and I want to serve it faithfully and have God someday say, well done. So whatever you do, whether you teach, whether you work over here on post, whether you're a secretary, whether you're a stay-at-home mom, you're a stay-at-home dad, or whatever it is, do for the glory of God so that you can someday say, God, I've done my duty for you. I gave you everything I had. Any Narnia fans out here? All right. In the first Narnia that we watched, uh, we saw on, on the big screen, there's a final battle where they're coming out and they're going to fight the great white witch, which is symbolic of Satan. Supposedly at this point, Aslan, who's the king who represents Jesus, has been killed on the sacred altar. Now they don't know as they're going into this battle that Aslan's alive. And many of us Christians, we forget Jesus is alive. He is raised from the dead. I was talking to the youth this morning, and a lot of them were giving me some answers. Well, I've kind of been raised. I've kind of been in church. I just kind of know that Jesus is risen from the dead. I said, you better just not know it. You better live it. You better experience it. You better breathe it. It better be everything to you. He's alive. We may not realize it, but Aslan's on the move, so is God is on the move. But listen to what happens in this, in this scene. So here we are, we have Peter. He's going to fight this great white witch without Aslan. He does not know that he's been risen. And he's at this battle scene, and next to him is Aureus. And Aureus is a centurion. He's, a, he's half man, half horse, and he's a valiant warrior. And he's standing there with this two-edged, two-hand sword, and he's standing there in battle. And Peter looks to him. He says, are you with me? And he says, to the death. My favorite scene in the entire movie. Are you with me? To the death. Could you imagine if Jesus looked to us? Are you with me? Would we be able to look back at him with great confidence to the death? That's servanthood. That is what Jesus wants us to do. Now hold that thought for just a moment as I read the scripture. Matthew 20, 25 through 28. Jesus called them to him and he said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must first be your servant and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the son of man, that's Jesus you all, came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So let's stop for just a moment. In here, our attitude needs to be, I am a slave to you, I am a servant to you. And you should say the same thing back to me. If you want to be great, if you want to be first, you have to be a servant. You have to be a slave. Now most of you didn't sign up for Christianity that way, but that's Christianity 101 right there. Today we're going to have a deacon ordination in a moment. Deacons are called to eat the dust, to serve, to wait tables of the people of God. They get the dirty work. I get to preach, they get to clean up, amen? Servants of the Lord. That by definition of what a deacon's supposed to do. That by definition is what every Christian is supposed to do, is to serve and to be a slave. So if we do those things, it will change our lives radically. I'm guaranteeing you in here. So I want to give this to you. Right now, I'm going to use my wife, and I ask permission to do this as an example. Listen, my, my wife makes me such a better man. I'm just going on the record for that. And everybody should say, Amen. so I can let her watch this video and she will hear those words. But right now, she's serving in children's church. Do you know that's not her gift? Do you know what her gift is? Music. Thank you, Kathy. And she needs to be right there on that keyboard with the praise team. She needs to be up here singing and leading worship because that's her gift and calling. But do you know why she's serving down there? Nobody else does. Not that nobody else necessarily would, but it needed to be launched and it needed leadership and she knew she was a servant. If no one else would do it, she would do it. So here's my question to you. Every single one of us should be serving and if everyone was serving, everyone would be able to serve in their giftedness to the king. I want to say that again. If everyone would be serving, then everyone would be able to serve out of their giftedness to the king. That is where we want to be. So I'm going to ask you, 
There's a card right now in your program. It's a white card. You thought you were going to dodge the bullet. Kathy, let me bother this for just a minute. You're not dodging this one. Here's a slave card. This is your card between you and the Lord. You can walk out of here and throw it away and not fill it out. That's between you and the Lord. You can fill it out and come lay it on the altar, do an altar call. That's between you and the Lord. And then it will become between you and Pastor Chris and others. Because I will call you on what you said God laid on your heart. On this card is so many options for you to check things. So my goal in this is this. Don't make Sean Nutter serve another day down there if God's called you to do that. And everybody said, and anybody like Shawnetta, if you need to serve in the nursery, where should you be serving? If you're supposed to be in children's ministry, where should you be? If you're supposed to be serving chili at the fall fest, where should you be? Thank you. Somebody's getting it up front. You should be serving where God's called you to serve. Are you tired? Are you busy? Come on, be honest. Are you tired? Are you busy? Who is not? Do you think Jesus wasn't tired? Do you think the apostles weren't tired when they kept getting imprisoned? Do you think the first deacon, after he was ordained, Stephen went out and preached the gospel and was stoned to death? Do you think that throughout time, people have not been tired and weary and had struggles and burdens and had to find out how am I going to feed my family and take care of this and have to struggle with everything in life? Yes. Martin Luther did. Lost children at young ages. Death was common. There were so many burdens. Those burdens will never leave us, but we can always serve him until we take our final breath and then we serve him for all of eternity. Amen? So I want you to take time to fill this out. And in a moment when we sing our song, literally, Lexington Park Baptist Church, I'm going to have you get a little Pentecostal on me, okay? We're going to bat Bapticostal today. Bapticostal, you all started off clapping. Yes, praise God. And now we're going to end with an altar, massive altar call where you can come and you can lay this on the altar and you can pray over it and you can lay it right down there for Jesus and then to turn it over to the church leadership to contact you to figure out. But here's what I want you to do. If you don't get a call back, what should you do? You pursue it. Did a slave have to wait for his king to call? A good slave is there, right? A good slave already knows his duties. A good slave is already doing what he's already supposed to do anyway. Amen? Pursuing it, finding it, serving it. Good news club. Awana. Youth group. Man, could you imagine if we had a one-to-one -one ratio with the youth group? Where I could sit down one-on-one -on -one with the youth, like right here, and share Jesus with Sean every single week. I'd get to know Sean, wouldn't I? I would invest in life. Sean would be changed, good or bad. He may not like it, but he would have to deal with Pastor Chris every single moment of youth group. Sean doesn't show up. Sean, where were you this week? Imagine being in one, a one-on-one -on -one ratio. And I know you all say, that's not realistic, Chris. It should be. It could be. Investing. Now, I know we're already doing good things and great things, and we already have people serving in these ministries. And so many other ministries. I know that's happening. But could you imagine that? What about those 350 people that walked through our door last night? We're a servant to them. We're a slave to them. Now let's go back. Remember Narnia. Here's where we end. Remember I asked you if Jesus stood up and he said, Are you with me? And you should say back to him, To the deaf. It says right here that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and he gave his life as a ransom. When we are in our greatest need, we looked at Jesus and said, are you with us? And listen to what he said, to the death. Jesus came to be your ransom. When we looked at Jesus and we look at that cross, when we say, God, are you for us? Are you with us? Is this really real? He says, to the death. And then he conquered death so that he could give you eternal life. That's the gospel, you all. The gospel that should change our lives to want to serve a servant is because Jesus first served us. Because when our greatest need, when we needed to go into battle, which is every day, by the way, but when we needed to go into battle for our soul, Jesus looked, and when we called upon his name, 
It says, anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. All because Jesus became a ransom for you and me. If you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you walked away from him today as you enter battle, look at him. Jesus, are you with me? And he will say to you, unto death. Because he already did it for you. So if you need Jesus in your life, don't leave this room. When this song starts to play, I want you to come up here and talk to one of the altar call people and say, I want Jesus. I want to look at him today in my life and to be able to say, Jesus, are you with me? And hear him say those words to me so that I know that I have eternal life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, today we have come to serve you as our king. Each one of us in this room, Father, has to make a decision you are present, how will we respond to you? Father God, in this moment, if someone has not bowed their knee to Jesus as Lord and Savior and King, may they do so this day. Others of us in here that have been your servants and called to be your slaves and called to be your children, Lord, we are here. Like you came to serve, Lord, here we are to serve you. Here we are to serve your church. May you inspire us today, encourage us today, uplift us today, give us strength today, and may we realize that we serve the King of kings and Lord of lords. May we do so as unworthy servants for the glory of you. And may we hear someday those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Father God, we thank you that we have come before your throne today, that we've opened the gates, that we've opened the doors, and the King is here. May we, with all of our hearts, truly surrender to you this moment. Not just a moment in time, but a moment in eternity. Where we have pledged to you to, to be your loyal subjects. Father, I pray for those that may be needing to make decisions in their life. And maybe this is all new to them and they didn't come up here today. But Lord, you're moving in their hearts. Lord, may they leave this place today knowing that you're Lord. So I want us all to say a prayer, maybe familiar to some of us and not to others. If you've already asked Jesus, just make this an affirmation of your faith, but in this moment, if you need to ask the King into your life, say these words with me. Dear Lord, everybody, dear Lord, I come before you as your subject. I surrender my life to you. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins and come into my life. And now I promise to you to serve you as my Lord, as my King. In Jesus' name.